Lemmebaum is like grown from being a nice kids herb for ADHD and focus and hyperactivity to being something that's great for seniors, for Alzheimer's and cognitive development and cognitive dementia. Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. I've been really looking forward to sitting down with Mary to hear her herbal story, as well as to get to hear her wisdom and insights after working with herbs for over 50 years. In this episode, we get to hear about her love of mints, especially lemon balm, as well as her take on herbs for pregnancy. And speaking of lemon balm, she also gives a great summary on the lemon balm and hypothyroidism issue. For those of you who don't already know her, Dr. Mary Bove is an herbal advocate, educator, and innovator who holds a doctorate of naturopathic medicine, midwifery certification, and a diploma of phytotherapy herbal medicine. She practiced naturopathic family medicine, herbal medicine, and midwifery for over 30 years, specializing in naturopathic pediatrics, botanical medicine, natural prenatal care, and home birth. She's been a student and user of herbal medicine for over 50 years. Once full-time faculty at Bastyr University, Dr. Bove chaired the departments of botanical medicine and naturopathic midwifery. Dr. Bove is the author of the Encyclopedia of Natural Healing for Children and Infants and co-authored Herbs for Women's Health. Mary has been published in many magazines, journals, and collaborative books on botanical and natural medicine. She has worked as medical educator and in formulation research and product development for Gaia Herbs, belonging to Gaia's Scientific Advisory Board for over 35 years. Dr. Bove currently consults, lectures, writes, and teaches internationally for Hartwood Institute on the topics of naturopathic medicine, botanical medicine, pediatrics, natural pregnancy, and childbirth, traditional food and medicine, and mind-body healing. Well, Mary, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to have you on the show today. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you for doing such a wonderful show for everyone. Ah, well, you know, it's a big team effort and it's been my absolute pleasure to do it. So I feel like I get, you know, just as much out of it as everyone else does. So because I get people on the show like you and um, I'm excited to hear about Lemon Balm. I'm excited to hear about other things from you, but I would love to begin by hearing your herbal story and all the ways that have woven together to bring you here with us today. Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, I would certainly say that my herbal story has been the majority of my life. And when mm. you were asking me about uh, a herb to pick, Lemon Mom came to me because it's, I think it's been one of the herbs that's been on that herbal journey from mm. the very beginning. So as a young woman, um, I think I was probably 18 or 19 when I first started to grow a few things. And Lemon Mom was one of those plants along with mint. And um, and so when I think about my journey, I think about not only like all of the places and the people that it, it's taking me to, but all the different plants and the opportunities that mm-hmm. have come in that time. And I found myself when I was a freshman in college really unhappy with my situation. Like I just didn't feel enthusiastic or fulfilled about what I was doing. And I changed my major within like the first three months of being a freshman at college. Mm -hmm. So you could see that I just wasn't happy. And then later in that year, I saw a little advertisement in the back of Mother Earth magazine and advertising Mm -hmm. a herbal uh, correspondence course from Vancouver, British Columbia, or not even Vancouver, it was from Alert Bay. And it just like 
screamed out at me and it it kind of lit me up inside and I thought what is this and who's a herbalist and how do you get to be a herbalist hmm. and and so that kind of like put me on this journey of like looking to see who could I study with or where do I find that information and I remember that year spending a lot of time in the library writing letters because they didn't have the internet back then and you, it was too expensive to call all over the uh, you know north right, america yeah. and so writing letters trying to find a place to study um because i i just wanted to go and study and i couldn't find that place and and my father was um he, he was a very strict Italian father. And so he had his own ideas and what didn't want me just gallivanting off without something constructive to do. As he <laughs> so I ended up actually finishing my degree in psychology, group counseling. And um, like two weeks after I graduated, I went with a friend and we went across the United States. She was moving to Seattle or Tacoma area. And I was going to go to Norma Myers Herbal Conference that was happening in Vancouver, Washington, in Vancouver, BC. And I was so excited. And going there uh, oh, changed my life. It opened up like the possibilities. Like I met other people who wanted to study or who were studying herbs, like Michael Tierra and Rosemary Gladstar and Ed Smith. And, and then I met all kinds of people who were wanting to learn and and who had started a little shop here in California or there. I remember I got my first pair of Birkenstocks when I was there that year in 1977. And, <laughs> and I got my a picture of my um, iris taken from Min and Jim, Jim, Jim Green to like do iridology. And so that really showed me like, wow, there is a place to do that. And so I ended up visiting a few herbal shops on my way down from Vancouver, took a bus back across the United States to Maine, where I was growing up, where I was living at the time, and um, decided I was going to open a herb shop. And so I, I proceeded to make all the arrangements, which was also difficult. There were only two or three herb suppliers and the U.S. and finding jars and just getting that all pulled together was, uh, you know, quite an ordeal. And I, I opened my herb shop. I was so excited and I named it Hippocrates Herbarium. Hmm. And in, in Portland, Maine, and nobody knew what to do with it. Like, no. <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time with the herbs and it gave me a chance to really learn the herbs in ways I hadn't really thought about. Like I'd always been interested in natural foods and, and the natural world and spent a lot of time gardening and, and knowing plants just from being in the woods. But this gave me a, a opportunity to like know the 200 herbs I had on the wall that nobody else bought. So I might as well figure out, you know, what do they all taste like and smell like and look like. And so in that time though, I, I met a woman who, who was uh, a member of the National Institute of Medical Herbalists in England. And I was like, there are medical herbalists like that. And having come from a medical family with my father, a physician, it just like kind of, again, lit me up. And I, mm -hmm. I wanted to know what, what was that about? So I started a conversation with Heinz Zelster about the school and found myself there in, a few years later. In between that time from my shop to the school, I ran a, uh, herb farm on the coast of Maine, Ram Island Farm Herbs, wow. and I uh, really didn't know what I was doing, but they gave me land and opportunity to do that work, and I learned a lot from that and grew herbs. I actually grew some mint for Tom's toothpaste back then, and wow. just, uh, you know, whatever you could do to, uh, I had my herb wreaths in the New Yorker magazine, and uh, mm -hmm. Paul Newman bought a few of them, just it was just wow. a small kind of world and you just had to do whatever you could do. But I did end up going to England and that really opened up my, my world when I looked at the clinical application and the history of how it had used, been used uh, um, in England and the UK for so long and that there were traditional 
herbalists there that you could, you know, apprentice with. And there was the school and there were people in that school and all they wanted to do were talk about herbs. And that's all I wanted to do. Was <laughs> so it was really exciting. And for me, it, it really kind of finally brought together the kind of the, the dream that I had when I heard that word herbalist back years before that. And mm -hmm. I, and I saw that I could do that. And I made the most of, of my opportunity with my apprenticeships while I was there so that I went as to as many different practicing herbalists around the UK as would take mm -hmm. me so to just get a sense of how they were doing it. And sometimes they would be a little more scientific or clinical or, or regimented others you know, may have been very traditional. I, I spent time with a, a woman who only ever dosed in 10 drop doses three times per day. And then I spent her with other clinical herbalists who dosed very high. And what I began to see was just the, the broad spectrum and how it was like a, a an opportunity to kind of calibrate to the person you had there. And so the the whole world of understanding individualized medicine and how herbs can apply to specific people and personalities as well as situations and health events. And it, it that was just, that's what I wanted to do. And it just kind of naturally came to me. And during that time I was in England, I ended up having both my children mm -hmm. uh, and did them through the midwifery uh, system there. My first one was a, um, a midwife delivered birth in the hospital that was just go in, have your baby, come right home. The second one was a home birth. But in that time, that also opened up an interest that I didn't really realize I had hmm. uh, to one, have a home birth, two, to understand how to work with pregnant people because pregnant people, they get sick too. And they mm. want to use herbs. They don't want to always use something over the counter. And so in my own pregnancies, I feel like I had opportunities to kind of test some of that belief and to, to see how herbs could play a role in that population. Um, mm. And that was extremely empowering to me. And that's kind of what brought me then to the fact that I, uh, you know, I wanted to work with children and I really wanted to, to, um, understand how herbs and the application of herbs could could fit into uh, children's health and wellness care. And there wasn't a lot out there. And when I came back to the States, I realized my degree from England was not going to get me very far. So I mm -hmm. looked around to see, was there an umbrella I would fit under, which was naturopathy. Mm -hmm. And I was able to get advanced standing into Bastyr University and do a degree in naturopathy. Um, and with that, also add on a degree in midwifery. And, and so it really just kind of gave me an opportunity to kind of fill a void because when I looked to see who could I apprentice with to learn about herbs for kids, there were two people in all of Seattle that were available to me until I looked into the midwifery community and the naturopathic midwives were like all about using natural remedies with babies and infants and six month olders. And that was like a real opportunity for me to, to really start to be able to apply my knowledge within that population. And I felt like at, at that time, herbs were getting more and more momentum but that was an area that there was a void. And I mm -hmm. thought, okay, you know, I can give women a choice about where they birth. I can help give families a choice about what they're using in their medicine chest. And not to say one's better than the other, but it's more about having options and understanding that these options can, you know, um, can really fill a medicine chest and, and be used in multiple ways for family health and wellness. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so then that just kind of let, you know, kind of spit me out in Seattle and I was v graduated with my degree in naturopathy. I had my medical herbalist degree and um, my midwifery. And I so I 
had to like get going. And I had the opportunity to work with a male midwife in Seattle through his birth center. And he no longer wanted to do home births. So he sent me out on whole, all his home births. And that was wonderful because my birth bag was filled with herbs. And mm. there are all kinds of ways in which I found herbs could, you know, fit in the birth room and fit in the birth practice, per se. So I practiced in Seattle. Oh, my goodness, for four or five years after I graduated, no, three years after I graduated. And in that time, started teaching at Bastyr as well and working with um, in the herbal medicine department because I, I've always had a huge desire to teach, teach mm -hmm. and, and kind of just spreading. I remember like meeting Norma for the first time. And her, one of the things that she told us that morning when we woke up in her um, two week herbal conference up in this little community center, you know, was that she really wanted us to take what we learned and go out and just keep talking about it and spread it and talk about it and, and spread the news about herbs. And it just, that was another piece that felt like right for me. Like the more I learned from clinical practice, the more I realized I wanted to talk about what I learned because it was not always the same as what I saw in the books. Hmm. And so I really wanted to like, I wanted hands on. I wanted to like see how, how the application. And so, yes, I had failures and side effects and adverse conditions and, you know, wonderful outcomes and surprises all from, you know, working with the herbs. But I felt like that information was something I really wanted to, to pass along. And I wanted to empower parents as well as I wanted to empower practitioners. So at one point in the 90s, when I first came east, I had a lot of naturopathic doctors calling me up from all over the United States at, asking me to make them formulas for their kids. So it was part of the reason why I approached Gaia Herbs to see if they wanted to make my kids line because I, mm. I was doing a clinical practice. I wasn't making a product line and it was too much work for me to try to supply all these formulas. So I thought if I had a reputable company making my formulas or it, it, as close as I, you know, might use if I was to standardize them. I thought that would certainly give other doctors formulas that were well tested and um, well developed for kids as far as safety and, and um, outcomes and use and that kind of thing. So that's kind of another piece that came from that. You know, um, but I, I would say that when I moved east, uh, I knew I would come east because that's where I had originally my home. My family was here and I came to Vermont. I did my undergraduate work up in uh, Burlington, Vermont. So I knew Vermont and um, I acquired a practice from a couple who were leaving Vermont. They'd been here for a couple of, of years. And I walked in that first day to a busy practice and continued mm -hmm. to have a practice and what was really funny is that the first day I had um, a uh, coyote brought in the back of a truck that had been hit by a car that somebody wanted me to treat and I remember thinking to myself okay this is not Seattle is <laughs> and you have to be like flexible you know <laughs> and um, and so yes I practiced there and did family medicine and birthing there for over 25 years and had a really wonderful community to work with and watched again um, the role of herbs and that herbs played in this community and how mm -hmm. accepted it was, but also, uh, you know, how many people uh, found that they actually preferred working with herbs once they mm -hmm. were, were managed with them or had the opportunity to, to you know, um, experience some of the delights of, of using herbs. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mary, that was so fantastic that um, I learned some new things about you that I hadn't known before. I want to circle back to a few things. Um, sure. But first, I just a reflection of like, you are just a voracious learner and go getter. Or you're just kind of like, I could just you like you saw an ad in Mother Earth News, and that just started you off on this path. And then you're going across the country. Um, you know, what a 
amazing thing that you were able to go meet all those herbalists and meet Norma uh, Myers. And then you just, then you like went over the pond and went all the way over to England to go study and had your kids there. I mean, you're just like a go-getter. You're all in um, teaching at Bastyr, et cetera. So yeah, I was, I love hearing that. And I, I often think that the best teachers are the ones who are like the voracious students. And I love that your learning came not just from books and, you know, but also I imagine from the plants and also um, from your own personal experience, which is so valuable. And then to share that with all of us too. Absolutely. I used to say about myself in the early days after I read Juliet's book and, and really realized, oh my gosh, I could be a herbalist. I decided I was a prisoner of herbs and I could either... <laughs> choose that path in my life and be extremely happy and fulfilled, or I could continue to and slosh down the psychology path. And, hmm. I, hmm. and I was so glad I chose the herbal path. How was your dad understanding? Did that become a constructive path for you? It, we both had a learning curve. That's yeah. for sure. It took yeah. some time. And in the beginning, certainly I think back in the seventies, it was not thought of as, even as a possibility that it could be alternative medicine. It was still witchcraft. And, mm. and he, he was very strict in the early days. But then when he's, he, I remember him coming to England and um, sitting in in a class and being like, wow, like he couldn't oh, believe that I was learning that type of um, science. And then mm. when he came to Bastyr, he had, the same um, experience. And I had asked him to actually teach a class on mm -hmm. one of his specialties, uh, hemophiliacs. And, and the, my class was delighted. And he, after that, I just recently found a letter he wrote to me um, about, oh, maybe about 10 years ago. And he's been passed for about since 2019. And he wrote to me, and really like, and just acknowledge my foresight, which I don't think mm -hmm. at the time I had a foresight that herbs would be so popular now in the 2000s. I think I was just mm -hmm. doing my thing. Mm -hmm. But he, he did acknowledge that and that I held fast to that, even though the road was rough. And then he put even at home. And I <laughs> knew that that was his way of like acknowledging that. Mm. <laughs> wow. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that story because we don't, not everyone, even now, even though herbs are more popular, we often do come up, you know, friction with our family or just other people, you know, who have not yet caught the herbal bug, um, but they will. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mary, t just today I got a question from somebody and this is a question I get a lot. And so since you're on, I want to just approach you with it. And the question is often like, um, you know, I'm pregnant or my partner's pregnant, what herbs are safe in pregnancy? Now I'm asking you this, but I'm not expecting you to like give a two hour class, which we know is like at least a necessary starting point, but what advice would you give? Because um, it's not always a clear cut issue. Like and there's not really lists that exist that are totally accurate. That's like yes or no in terms of, you know, there's so many caveats. Anyway, I don't want to answer the question for you because you're the expert on this. But what is your advice to someone who's like, okay, I'm, I'm into herbs, but now I'm pregnant. What are the concerns or considerations or cautions I should have? It's such a great question, Rosalie. And it's one that's really important. And, you know, even if it, it, it in the sense that it helps to bring somebody um, some ease or to feel relaxed or or empowered or or for them to be educated enough to make a comfortable decision for themselves. And one of the things also that I feel is important is to, to remember that pregnancy is a it's a different state even with the in the physiological body itself. And so I tell people if they're taking herbs and they're on herbs regularly as a supplement, that they should stop those in their early part of pregnancy. And particularly in that early first trimester, you know, focus on good eating and exercise and relaxing and breathing and getting enough water and use beverage herbs. So you may, maybe you're a little nauseous and you use some fennel and chamomile, or maybe you need a little help for sleep and you use a little bit of holy basil, but you want to do it within uh, what I say, common sense. You're not going to drink, 
you know, 10 cups of chamomile tea because that's, that's excessive, but you may drink a cup at bedtime. Mm -hmm. um, as you move on in the pregnancy, the pregnancy gets more established. There's a little more leeway in the herbs that are uh, safe. Certainly what we call the amenagogues, plants that create the menses to, to come on would be contraindicated in, in pregnancy. And the, the plants that are harsh and strong, so anything that's a uterine irritant or a harsh laxative can create uterine uh, irritation and contraction. So you wanna stay away from harsh laxatives, strong herbs that have a lot of alkaloids in them, and even strong herbal preparations. So this would be a time to say, do I need a standardized or a 500 milligram capsule or would a tea be appropriate? And really, I think at that point it is, it's really, you know, winding down some of those preparations that are more pregnancy friendly, working with the herbs that we know. And there is good research on some herbs that can be used safely in pregnancy um, and getting educated, seeking out. And, and as I mentioned earlier, the midwifery community has used plants limited within their um, skills, but they have a lot of information on plants that can be used safely or how they might be used. But if we're using herbs as medicine during pregnancy, you really need to have guidance and you need to have the skills to choose pregnancy friendly herbs and to know how to deliver them for how long and how that might be. Um, for instance, and I feel like sometimes, you know, as a, a herbal student going along my path, I feel like I met opportunities to learn that were like stumbling blocks or pushed in my face. And so I actually ended up with a severe pneumonia in my second pregnancy um, while I was in England. And uh, I was probably 32 weeks at the time. And I, I reached out to a couple of my teachers and I ended up going, when I saw my OB, he was like, if you want to have a home birth and you need to like take antibiotics, da, da, da. And I remember walking home with that prescription and saying to myself, what do you believe, Mary? What do you really believe? What do you feel like you can do? And I got, by the time I got home, I thought I am putting this prescription right up here on the mantle. I have one week till I see him again. And I am going to get better with what I believe. And so mm -hmm. I did. I took herbs. Mm -hmm. I took a, a, a very simple three different things that I used. Uh, it, garlic, you know, and I did that as scordalia. So I used chopped raw garlic and mashed potato on crackers. And I ate a ton of it. I used thyme. And I use echinacea. And when I went back a week later, he said, very good. I think you're doing great. We can do a home birth. And I gave him the prescription back. And he said, what? And he had birthed my first baby. And he like, he just looked at me and he said, he said to me, you Americans, you're just so stubborn. And I said, well, I don't know about every American, but this one is. <laughs> and it helped me to see that when there's a reason you know, there are herbs can be used safely. Now, would I have used 10 milligram milliliters of thyme three times a day for weeks upon weeks during pregnancy? No, but for a short duration for an acute illness like that, that I felt like I could manage, I did. And so that was a part of my learning to push myself to that place to then know what, what kind of was the range that I might work with or what what were the herbs and so i built a materia medica that i felt based on what was safe in first trimester second trimester and third trimester and as you mentioned the lists are confusing they're not inclusive some includes too many like one of the most popular questions i'd get at my clinic every you know summer beginning at that you know june and july would be Pregnant women calling and asking, could they eat pesto? Because they saw in her book that basil was contraindicated in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And to not have that, just have that plant put on a list like that and not qualified to say essential oil of basil orally taken is a contraindicated in pregnancy, but used as a culinary herb, it is okay. Mm -hmm. it, again, as long as you're not eating pesto three meals a day, seven days a week, 
all through your pregnancy. So that, you know, an ounce of common sense is important. Mm hmm. No, oh, thank you for that answer. And that was great that like during your pregnancy, you had so much knowledge under your belt already that you were able to apply that. And I like how you're talking about, you know, midwives and other herbalists, they have the experience and it's never a bad idea to check in with somebody if you're pregnant and have issues that are, you know, a special case, sickness, et cetera, um, because there are answers out there, but because they're just not always like, you know, right or wrong, it's just really good to get support along the way from people who are experienced. Speaking of resources, Mary, I picked up your book, The Encyclopedia of Natural Healing for Children and Infants, um, before our chat. And now I forget, though, the book, was it published in 2001? Is that the latest printing? So was, uh, 2003 was the latest 2003, printing. 2003. So it's, you know, we can't say that it's a brand new book. We're, it's a little over 20 years now. And I was flipping through it. It is so relevant. Everything in there is so good. I mean, it mean it can sit, you know, maintains its integrity as a really solid resource for people. So um, I don't want to go away Thank without you. mentioning that book and Thank how you. that's a for people who are on the other side of you know the the post pregnancy and are wondering now what do I do? Uh, that is just a really excellent excellent resource there. Absolutely. And it's great to, you know, hear you comment that you feel like it's relevant because I, 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 you know, I sometimes think, oh, that was 20 years ago. There's so many things that have changed. But sometimes when you go back and you see what are the mainstay foundational herbs that we use with children, they've not really changed that much. Mm -hmm. We've yeah. added a few things, maybe because the world is getting, you know, smaller to us and we can access, you know, other plants from all around the world. But I do think that the basic premise, and if you look around on, you know, herbal shelves and in formulas and books, you see some of these, you know, foundational formulas, which I'm so happy to be able to see it's so much of that information available uh, or products available to families nowadays. And once, I actually just wanted to touch on Gaia Herbs real quick because, um, I love Gaia herbs, honestly. <laughs> like I am all about making my own herbal medicines. I'm all about like being in touch with the plants. And um, but there's probably not a day that goes by that I don't have something from Gaia Herbs. I, I mean, they are truly one of my favorite companies because of their quality. The dosages that are in their products are actually like reliable in that sometimes I don't, you know, you go pick up whatever off the shelf and they have 30 herbs in a capsule. You know, it's just like how how much of an herb is even in that cap? You know, you're just kind of like, how did this formula even happen? And um, their extracts are so cool. Their elderberry gummies are the best. Um, those extra strength gummies actually have like a medicinal dose of elderberries in there without excessive sugar. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to like share my love of Gaia. But how cool is it that you've been formulating with them for so long? And the formulas, um, again, like I just love everything about Gaia herbs. So. Yeah, I, you know, I feel like I had a wonderful opportunity to work with Rick Scalzo um, in the early days, as well as, you know, work on that, the child's line, the kid's mm -hmm. line, and the kid's line really, like, um, kind of stretched some of the, the formulas at that time, because I was asking for some different kinds of things mixed together. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just during my many roles with the time I was at Gaia, I really have to say that I, I really had a lot, have a lot of respect and like you, uh, really like their formulas and their mm -hmm. herbs and the quality of their herbs. Oh, wonderful. Well, Mary, if there's one thing I know about you, it's that you love mints. Um, I've, I've been in classes with you where you've taught about mints. And for today, you chose lemon balm, a wonderful mint, possibly one of my very favorites. Well, you mentioned that lemon balm was early on your path, guiding you along the way. But I'd love to hear more about why you chose lemon balm. And then I'd love to hear you know, anything you'd like to share about how you like to work with it. Oh, yeah. I You know, I love... I love herbs and I, you know, I brought, was, came to them fairly early, I would say. And part of that had to do with my mom and my mom likes mm -hmm. scents and mm -hmm. she liked essential oils. And so there were a few special little vials that lived in a little rose jar in my, in my living room of the house I grew up in. And, um, 
we made rose jars and potpourris and the lemon balm that I grew in my garden was part of that. And so that was part of, I think, how it grabbed me was the wonderful lemon scent. And then later on, as I studied pharmacology and um, pharmacokinetics of plants and learned about the essential oil and the limbic system and how it affects our happiness, I just like thought, wow, you know, nobody ever told me that back then, but I always felt uplifted by that. And I also, as a, a um, young woman, I think I was a senior in high school, I went to Adele uh, Simmons, uh, the Christmas herbal. I went to her Capri Farms Christmas uh, uh, herbal outing, and it was a day, and everything was decorated with herbs, and there were little pillows and all kinds of things, and uh, lemon balm was, was one of the herbs and the pillows and the potpourris. And it just like, again, left a strong impression mm. for me. So when I first started my shop in 1978, I, um, I had a few teas that I, I, I made, blended teas. One was um, mainly meadow, mainly spelled M-A-I-N-E-L-Y. <laughs> meadow tea so that was like anything that was found in a main meadow went in that tea mm -hmm. and the other was the lemon rose tea and that basically um was made up in the beginning of lemongrass lemon balm and rosemary mm -hmm. and i would ha have to say that the other herb that's been with me on my lo long journey of studying herbs is rosemary Mm -hmm. And back in those times, they were thought of aromatics. They were nice beverage teas. They, you know, were, were teas that might be used to settle the tummy or to help with sleep or calm the nerves a little bit. There wasn't really a, a lot of oomph. And I remember going to the naturopathic school and having to, um, as the chair of the botanical medicine department, they had a list of herbs we wanted to teach. And, I, and lemon balm was one of the ones they wanted to take off. And I was like, no, we're not taking this plant off. And they're like, well, there's no scientific data. It's just really a nice tea mm -hmm. to drink, you know, to settle your tummy like chamomile. And, and I put my foot down and said, no, no, no. And having come from Britain, I, I you know, I did have a lot of a different kind of understanding of the use of the plant than what mm -hmm. I was seeing there at that time. And now I look back at it, and if you look in like half the herbal formulas out there and supplements that have to do with nootropic or, you know, cognitive function or brain health um, or, or focus, we see lemon balm. Um, so lemon balm is like grown from being a nice kid's herb for ADHD and focus and hyperactivity to being something that's great for seniors, for Alzheimer's and cognitive development and cognitive dementia. There's so many things that one might think of taking lemon balm for. And long before you need to take it for an illness, I say get it into your life. It can be a syrup and a butter and it can be in cooking and it can be, you know, it put into vinegars. And there are so many ways that we can use lemon balm day in and day out or, you know, as a daily type of wellness herb that will help keep us well and keep us relaxed and keep us, you know, able to deal with the daily stressors that, so they don't build up to be too much. And that's really what I think about the, the role it plays in my life is that, you know, I like to smell it. I like to have it around so I smell it. I use the essential oil when I go into a hotel room and disperse it there and help to spray the sheets. It helps me sleep. It makes that, that energy mine. It, it picks up my mood. Mm -hmm. um, I've watched it be helpful to seniors as an aromatherapy. I've watched it be extremely helpful for digestive issues, um, all the way from something like dyspepsia to um irritable bowel or inflammatory bowel disease. And so I see the diversity of such a plant. And I think about that little struggle of like holding tight in the beginning when people were looking for science and, and standardized extracts and research data. And I think about the researcher Kennedy who did that 
all the initial work with kids in Lemonbaum um, and kept pushing forth and, and, you know, and then it blossomed. And mm -hmm. now I, I think, and when people say to me, oh, I want to start with a herb that I can grow, I tell them, start with lemon balm. Because most <laughs> of the time, though I don't know, I've never tried to, I've never lived in the Southwest. So maybe lemon balm doesn't grow so well in the Southwest. But certainly I, I would say, you know, in all the places I've lived, I've been able to keep a lemon balm plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's often that saying, like, um, if you want to feel like a gardener, grow lemon balm or something like that, you know, it's like kind of focus on how easy that is. Um, I don't know where this came from, Mary, but early on in my herbal studies, I remember reading in numerous places that lemon balm just didn't work as a tea and like dried lemon balm just wasn't good. And so for years, I didn't have dried lemon balm as a tea, which just seems so ridiculous now. But I'm curious, like, have you did? Do you ever remember a time when lemon balm was kind of like disregarded as a tea? Yeah, I think that part of that had to do with the lack of quality in the market. So mm -hmm. in the initially, like in the 80s, if you went to buy lemon balm at the co-op out of a jar, it was just a it yeah. smelled like hey, there's no lemon and it's kind of flavor. And so I think that in that right, a lot of the, you know, the aromatic part, which you're going to get from a tea um, is like lost. And so I think the quality was poor. Um, and when not only quality, but when I think people started doing small um, herb farms and the little herb houses started growing. And, and I remember at Ram Island Farm when I grew my own lemon balm and, and we dried it in the in the drying room. And it was just like, whoa, this is so different than what is coming from the herb shops or the co-op. Mm -hmm. And I think that changed things. Mm -hmm. Also, I, I think when um, when we started to look at at uh, the aromatic compounds in plants, I think we began to recognize just how active they were and how much um, of the of their blend of them, not just the essential oil, but the compounds within the essential oil, were you know partaking in the medicinal actions of lemon balm. So mm -hmm. I think now one is that that um, we have much better extracts and qualities and we have CO2 extracts in all different ways. We have hydrosols, all different ways that we can interact with this plant. But again, I think, you know, having it fresh, walking through your garden and brushing your hand over it or putting a sprig of it in the bouquet on your desk before the clients come in, it, it, you know, it was one of the plants that I would use to put back my patient when they kind of disintegrated during their visit. So if they got real emotional at the end of the visit and time was up and I knew, oh, we have five more minutes of this visit and they're crying, I would use a little bit of lemon balm spray and spray mm -hmm. it around the room and around them and breathe it with them to help kind of get them centered, get, given the fact that we were going to have to end our visit. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting use for lemon balm that I've never heard before. Thank you for sharing that. And you've also shared with us a lemon rose tea, which listeners can download a beautifully illustrated copy of that. You kind of mentioned it earlier, but I'm not sure if there's anything else you'd like to say about your lemon rose tea. Well, I think that over the years, my my access to uh, better quality herbs and growing them myself and um, just my knowledge led me to kind of make different versions of mm. the lemon rose tea. So now, uh, you know, I feel like lemongrass, lemon balm, or lemon verbena, any one or all three of those make a great lemon base for the tea. And I do like having the rosemary because it kind of tastes like a lemon pine um, taste. But adding a little bit of rose petal can make that very nice. And so that's a way to soften that rosemary a little bit and kind of um, bring a little bit more of a calming uh, feeling to the tea rather than and taking that stimulating edge off the rosemary. So sometimes mm -hmm. I'll actually 
have two roses and three lemons in that tea. Hmm. Oh, I love that. I also, I love the combination of lemon balm and rose, like just that simple duo is so wonderful. Um, and I've also loved adding lemon verbania and lemon balm together too. So it's interesting to hear that you like that as well. Yes, I can't winter, you probably can't winter over too many things in your garden. So mm -hmm. I do bring in a little lemon verbena uh, to mm -hmm. have what plant inside all winter long. The mm -hmm. lemon balm tends to get white fly, but I can keep a lemon verbena. And I get up every morning and run my fingers through it and just smell mm -hmm. that scent and welcome the day. Oh, well, that's a good tip. I do grow it, but I just grow it for the season, you know, and just harvest a little bit of it. But I, I can't stop myself from not growing it. So I have a little bit of it, but I'm going to try and bring it in now. So yeah, thanks for that tip. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share about lemon balm before we move on? Oh, yeah. So I I, I think I mentioned it a little bit, but I, I would think of it as a, um, you know, a, a baby's infant herb, a herb that can be used with kids, a great herb with teenagers, particularly with the brain development changes that occur with them or focus at school. You could use it just during the school week and not necessarily during the home week, you know, the being home on weekends. And one thing I did want, I do want to say is that so, sometimes I think, you know, in this world of information, sometimes I think we jump on information and sometimes continue to pass it along without always um, investigating everything. And so one of the things that I feel that I like to do, and I kind of did with the pregnancy herbs, was to investigate why is something contraindicated. Mm -hmm. And so when I started seeing contraindications for lemon balm and hypothyroidism, it made me very curious because it didn't sit with what I knew or what I, what resonated with me about the plant. So I started going and looking at the, the work that was done on lemon balm used in hyperthyroidism um, and the fact that it was shown to be helpful in helping to quiet hyperthyroidism. And then I went a little further to look at some of the dynamics behind that and recognized that lemon balm and particularly rosemarinic acid, which is found in lemon balm, um, had an effect on the immune production of antibodies that would then uh, help to quiet a hyperthyroid or Graves patient. And so, but what someone took away from that was that it made antibodies that inhibited the thyroid, which is not ex at all what it was. It had an effect on how much antibody was being produced in the immune system. So it changed the immune response, not the thyroid response. So I personally don't feel that lemon balm is uh, contraindicated in hypothyroid uh, or normal thyroid patients. I don't feel like it will make a thyroid more sluggish if it already is sluggish. And I can see multiple different avenues and reasons why it could actually be quite helpful to a patient who was hypothyroid. So that's my little aside and my little myth breaker. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. I can't believe I almost forgot to ask you about that specifically. Um, yeah, that is, it is interesting how pervasive that is and how people will know very little about herbs, but they'll know that. I mean, I just this week got a question from someone that said, um, that their child had a hypothyroid and they knew not to use lemon balm, but was there anything else they shouldn't use? And I was like, well, let's back up a little bit. Um, right. Actually, I did a video uh, and a podcast on lemon balm. And for whatever reason, it hit like the YouTube algorithms, right? Or whatever. And there's been hundreds of thousands of views on that one, but that it was all, you know, it was like a big part of that video was about how this has been this pervasive myth. It's just, it's interesting, like how popular that myth is and how widespread and just how dearly some people want to hold on to it too. So yeah, thank you. It's really it valuable to hear that from you and just your own research and your own conclusions and your own clinical experience too. So very valuable. Yeah. How fast it got picked up. And even like I teach uh, for the Heartwood school out of the UK. And, you know, all those students, when they list using a lemon balm in a formula, they'll say, you know, contraindicated in hypothyroidism. And I'm like, whoa, just like you're constantly coming up with that, you know, that fact, that kind of piece of myth comes up 
just so often. So mm -hmm. I'm so glad to hear. I'm going to have to go and listen to your uh, YouTube podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, thank you so much for all that you've shared, Mary. And I know you have an exciting event coming up, and I would love to hear more about that. I'm excited for other people to hear about it as well. Oh, plants and people at the pond. Mm -hmm. It is a very exciting event for me. You know, it takes me out of the clinical realm. And sometimes when you're, you know, you've been lecturing in the clinical realm, pe people don't want you to move out of your realm. And, you know, and so I really like this because this is really puts me into the natural world, which I love. Mm -hmm. And it puts people um, into the natural world and it takes away uh, distractions that we have in modern day living. So this is an opportunity for someone to, you know, use um, a, a canoe and learn canoe skills. You don't have to have canoe skills or camping skills to go. Last year, we had an opera singer from Boston who had never been canoeing or fishing or mm -hmm. camping before who fell in love with um, being out in the pond. And it's remote. It's, you know, it, it uh, very few people go to the pond. So the opportunity to see plants is amazing. And there's uh, some floating bogs, pitcher plants, mm -hmm. And um, just that whole opportunity is great. And what we do is we really just work with, with intuition, with sitting with the plants and drawing the plants. So it's a little bit like a, um, a Gertian study where you're, you're looking and approaching the plant and, and, and kind of getting a sense of and that plant. And so during the week that we're on the pond, everyone has a plant. They visit the plant regularly. We draw it. We you know, see it in a variety of different weathers or daytimes. And at the end, we spend time sharing what we've learned about the plant. And there's just some amazing things that happen. For instance, I'll just share one little story where one woman um, ended up choosing <clears throat> monotropa or ice plant um, or ghost pipes. People know it as that. And uh, she ended up putting her, she kept seeing it. And then she ended up putting her, her tent near it. And I said, she said, I can't think about what plant to choose. There's so many. I was like, Hey, you've already been chosen. That plant has chosen you. Look at how many times you've like come across it in the last two hours. So she chose that. And she, she did a wonderful drawing of the plant in her first impressions of the plant, which are somewhat energetic. It's not like doing a botanical drawing. It's about, you know, what's the feeling of this plant? What's the energy that it's putting out? What are, what are the words that you might get and how and draw that? And so she ended up drawing this, this beautiful kind of pinkish fluorescent um, multi-lobed, what looked kind of like a flower. Um, and so at the end of our time, she asked, could I take a few ghost pipes home and make a tincture? And she got home and she cut the, the ghost pipe, the monotropa flower in half. And she, I hadn't let them do that at the pond. And when she did, she saw that it looked exactly like what she drew. Oh, wow. And she was shocked. She was like, she immediately texted me the picture and said, look at this. It looks exactly what I drew, but I never opened up this flower. Mm -hmm. I said, no, but you visited it in other ways. Yeah. And so that just was such a great way for us to learn together um, mm -hmm. and to, to work with, you know, very new plants. Like they chose my plant, a plant that I didn't know at all. So they put mm -hmm. me to the test as well. Um, and it was great. It was a really great opportunity. So I and I think that people, if we're caught up in modern day, if we're caught up in the computer and screen time, that this is a great opportunity to open up our senses in other ways and learn in other ways and be surprised by what it is you do learn. Yeah, it sounds like a really wonderful opportunity for like just these powerful connections uh, with the natural world. Where exactly yeah. is this um, adventure at? It's up in the Allagash of Maine. And so we go with two Maine registered guides. One um, of the guides has been guiding. He's in his mid-70s. He's been guiding for over 40 years. And he has amazing skills that he brings, as well as first aid skills with many of the bog plants. So he brings uh, uh, that. He also 
took us to some virgin forest where I saw the biggest patch of Michella I've ever seen in my life. It went on and on and on. I couldn't, I just like, I wanted to just kiss it and kiss it mm -hmm. and kiss it. It was just so beautiful. And then um, the, our other guide is a boat builder and he ha he is um, also very skilled and uh, has does a wonderful job at setting up our camps. Uh, making sure that we have what we need and that the camp meals are outrageous. We have pineapple mm. upside down cake, blueberry cobbler, you and they will cook to dietary needs as well. So it's it's really a wonderful experience and a, a time in which you can connect with people, you connect with plants, and you can also learn some outdoor skills. Mm. There's nothing really that tastes better than food like out when you're camping. Like there's just something so special about it. It's just so good. Um, what are the dates for the trip this year? Those dates are um, the last Roughly. Saturday in July, which I believe is the 29th to, or the last Sunday in July, I should say, sorry. And, and we'll be back the first Saturday in August. Lovely. It's a Great week to go, and unbelievably enough, in the Allagash uh, at that time, there's not a lot of bugs. Oh, perfect. <laughs> well, we will put the link to that in the show notes so people can check out all the details. Thanks for yeah, sharing about that. You. Well, before you go, I have one last question for you, and that question is How do herbs instill hope in you? Oh, wow. Well, a couple of things. I have to say that just being on the herbal path for the majority of my life and seeing where they've come, how they've integrated with people and coexisted, and then also how um, how they've managed to, to kind of win over so many people's hearts. Um, from scientists to culinary people to medical people to, you know, the simple farmer or the housewife or the mom or the dad or whatever. I just think that that, you know, lets me know that there's, you know, the power of plants. And that to me, I always say to myself, herbs can help. Whether that is, you know, bringing a little joy helping to change the smell in a room, helping to change somebody's pain or discomfort. You know, I, I think that there's always a place for them. And so we don't have to always think of them as a medicine we put in our mouth, but that medicine is, comes in in multiple ways. And so one of the things as a young herbalist, someone asked me what, well, we how, where would you like to see herbs in 20 years? And I remember saying, I'd like to see them be a common option and choice for people in the mainstream and for them to to you know be a part of what we consider a, a, a way to be well and healthy and um and i would say i see that uh now i do worry sometimes that marketing can kind of change things around um and but i feel like there are so many people who are so committed to uh, herbal knowledge and the herbal way and bringing them forth and holding them in the light and the reverence that they belong. Um, I feel like, yeah, that they've, they've caught on and they've lit the fire under many, many people. And whether it's a, you know, a mom and a dad who incorporated into a family or someone, you know, a physician who brings it into their clinical room, they really have, um, you know, become a voice in, in health and wellness, mm -hmm. I think. And not just for humans, for two-leggeds and four-leggeds and for the earth. Uh, so I just I just think, you know, plants are powerful. Mm, well said. Yeah, it is fun to see them, like, just continue to gather momentum and change people's hearts and minds and just those connections that come later. Well, thank exactly. you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mary, for being here, for answering my additional questions and for sharing so much wisdom with us and really appreciate it. It's really just been an honor to have this time with you. So thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for the work you do and the opportunity for us to have a chat about 
something we love, herbs. Herbs, yes. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Don't forget to head over to the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com to download your beautifully illustrated recipe card and to get a transcript of this show. There, you'll also be able to sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is the best way to stay in touch with me. The best way to check out Mary's offerings is on Instagram at Dr. Mary Bove ND. You can also visit the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com for links on how to join Mary's other adventures, like her plant trip in Maine, which sounds fabulous. If you'd like more herbal episodes to come your way, then one of the best ways to support this podcast is by subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks, and I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Also, a big round of thanks to the people all over the world who make this podcast happen week to week. Nicole Paul is the project manager who oversees the whole operation from guest outreach to writing show notes to actually uploading each episode and so many other things I don't even know. She really holds this whole thing together. Francesca is our fabulous video and audio editor. She not only makes listening more pleasant, she also adds beauty to the YouTube videos with plant images and video overlays. Tatiana Rusikova is the botanical illustrator who creates gorgeous plant and recipe illustrations for us. I love them. I know that you do too. Christy edits the recipe cards and then Jenny creates them as well as the thumbnail images for YouTube. Michelle is the tech wizard behind the scenes and Karen is our student services coordinator and customer support. For those of you who like to read along, Jennifer is who creates the transcripts each week. Xavier, my handsome French husband, is the cameraman and website IT guy. It takes an herbal village to make it all happen, including you. One of the best ways to retain and fully understand something you've just learned is to share it in your own words. So with that in mind, I invite you to share your takeaways with me and the entire Herbs with Rosalie community. You can leave comments on my YouTube channel, on the herbswithrosaliepodcast.com show notes page, or simply hit reply to my Wednesday email. I read every comment that comes in and I'm excited to hear your herbal thoughts on lemon balm, herbs for pregnancy, or anything else that Mary shared. Okay, you've lasted to the very end of the show, which means you get a gold star and this herbal tidbit. Well, Mary mentioned how lemon balm has gone from being sort of overlooked to really respected, especially in the medical world because of the clinical trials that are being published. So I thought for this herbal tidbit, we could check in on recent studies, and I immediately found three that I think will be of interest to you. The first is a 2023 randomized controlled trial that looked at the effects of Melissa officinalis extract containing rosemarinic acid on cognition in older adults without dementia. I really like this study because it was a clinical trial done on humans, but I would love to see a similar study using lemon balm as a whole plant. In any case, the results were that this extract may help prevent cognitive decline in older adults without hypertension. The next study is a 2023 randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled clinical trial, which means basically it was just very well organized and designed, and it looked at the effects of Melissa officinalis on depression and anxiety in type 2 diabetes patients with depression. And the results showed a significant decrease in depression and anxiety severity at the end of the study. And this last one is a 2021 double-blind crossover clinical trial looking at the effect of Melissa officinalis on systolic and diastolic blood pressures in essential hypertension. And the results showed that lemon balm can reduce both systolic and diastolic blood pressures in patients with essential hypertension. So that's just three recent studies showing lemon balm's benefit for keeping our brains healthy, uplifting our mental health, and reducing blood pressure. If you'd like to know even more of Lemon Balm's gifts, be sure to check out my solo episode, which is a deep dive into all things Lemon Balm. Cheers.